Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Community Pharmacy West Yorkshire Connect event about workload. Um, my name is Ruth Buchan. I'm CEO here at Community Pharmacy West Yorkshire. So um, tonight isn't going to be a, a usual kind of event with slides and, and people talking. We're going to try um, having a bit of a conversation. Um, I'll introduce them shortly, but I've got um, three of my committee members here are going to be part of a panel um, answering the questions we have around the topics we're covering tonight. Um, I can also say we have another committee member um, on the meeting um, who's Ashley. So um, welcome Ashley to the meeting as well. So why are we having an event about workload? Um, well, Community Pharmacy West Yorkshire, we really are aware of the pressures and the funding, sorry, I'm letting people in, and the funding constraints that, that you're facing. Um, you know, the economic circumstances pharmacies are in at the moment is, is not great, and we know sustainability has been pulled into question for many of you. Um, the PSNC uh, did a pressures audit, and thank you to many of you that completed that audit. That's been really helpful. And they published some of the results uh, earlier on this week, and it does make, I have to say, quite difficult reading. Um, it outlines uh, that 91% of our pharmacies are experiencing staff shortages. The 80% report that the costs to run their pharmacies are much higher than this time last year. Nine out of 10 pharmacies have seen a significant increase in phone calls from patients and 86% report an increased um, rise in requests for healthcare advice. We know that these pressures are impacting on uh, the mental health and wellbeing of our staff, and that was reported uh, by 82% of people in the survey. Um, and we also know that you know, the workloads coming from lots of different directions, it's around medicine supply issues too, they're, they're really, really common. So, um, you know, we absolutely uh, hear that at Community Pharmacy Pressure Launch, and I'm sure that those things really resonate with you guys as well. Um, you know, we hear those pressures you face, and so we're really hopeful that tonight, um, this event will help um, you um, hear from our officers who are going to be on the virtual sofa tonight asking uh, answering questions that I put to them hear how they're facing these challenges and how some of the changes that they're doing also hear about what is a requirement under the contract and actually what we are not required to do and how we can navigate some of that so um, without further ado I'm now going to introduce um, the Community Pharmacy West Yorkshire um, committee members of the group tonight um, Kim, uh, can I ask you to just go on to mute, please? Please to come off mute. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, so, uh, firstly, at the top of my screen, I've got David, David Broom. Hi, uh, I'm David Broom. I'm an independent contractor in North Leeds. I'm the treasurer for the LPC and also the PSNC representative for Yorkshire and Humber. Thank you, David. Uh, next, I've got Mohammed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mohamed Ikhlaq, Independent Contractor, Leeds Bradford, and Chair of Community Pharmacy West Yorkshire. Thank you, Mohamed. And last but certainly not least, we have Amanda. Hi, yeah, um, I'm Amanda Smith. I'm representing Independent Contractor in Calderdale, and I'm Vice Chair. Thanks, Amanda. So. The first topic we've got as our, you know, on our virtual sofa is multiple compartment compliance aids, MCAs. Now we all call them many different things, DOSETs, MDSs, but I'm sure we'll slip between the terms, but MCAs. So we know there's been an increase in demand for MCAs over the years. Um, and many people think that they're helpful for patients, but we know the evidence is just not there to support that view. We also have become aware that a few practices have been um, moving towards 28 day prescriptions and are refused, refusing to do seven day prescriptions and indeed sometimes changing patients who have been on seven day prescriptions for quite some time across to 28 days. So um, my first question um, is, you know, does a pharmacy have to supply medicines in an MCA? So which one of you would like to take that for me? I'll take that one. Thank you, Dave. Um, no, is the answer that you don't have to supply medicines in an MCA. And actually, there are quite a lot of medicines that shouldn't be supplied in an MCA, even if a MCA is requested by the GPs. And, you know, from personal experience, you know, we will stick to the guidance that it says if it shouldn't go in an MCA, it, then we do not supply the products in an MCA. We might supply an MCA as well, but if a product shouldn't go in an MCA, we don't put it in unless there are exceptional clinical circumstances. Um, 
but uh, on the whole, um, no, we, we, we just don't. It's David, how do you know what shouldn't go in an MCA? Where did you find that information? We tend to use the um, SPS, Specialist Pharmacy Service website that tells you whether things have got stability data to go in a, an MCA or not. Uh, we routinely don't put uh, controlled drugs in and we, on the whole, do not use drugs um, where the drug is, is changing strength or things like warfarin and the likes where the, the dose may change mid mid week never mind mid four boxes but actually change from a, on a day-to-day -day basis thanks david thank you um so i also uh, i hear this a lot from people that work in general practice they say that pharmacies are required to make a formal robust assessment for an mca so are pharmacies required to do an assessment for an MCA? Who'd like to take that one? So Ruth, um, uh, I'll take that one. So I would say it's a good practice to do it. Um, the assessment would be in particular to make sure that a patient who may have a disability under the Equalities Act isn't discriminated against. If there was a need for you to make a reasonable adjustment um, to help them to take medicine. Um, and so for that reason, I would say it's, it's good practice to do one. Now, there isn't a, um, a, a specific um, assessment out there that you, know, that you should use. There are some um, guides out there that you could use, um, PSNC, for example. Um, there's some that you'll find um, uh, information about this on our website as well at CPWY. So, you can choose whatever assessment you, you do, as long as you have a, a good conversation with the patient about why um, an MCA is requested, and, and then what conclusion you come to. Um, so as long as that's recorded in, in case you ever needed to justify that to anybody, um, I, I would say that that's the reason to, to recommend that it's done, um, but there's no requirement in law to do it. Thanks, Mo. And yeah, we've got um, a link to the University of East Anglia's um, MCA decision aid on our website. There isn't many out, you know, there is lots of different aids out there, but that's one which we know that the RPF have been supporting. So we've got that link on our website. So, as I said, we are seeing a trend um, around uh, GP practice changing all seven days to 28 days. Um, now, when I ask people why they're doing this, there is this often a misconception that's cheaper for the NHS. And I just think it goes to show that there is a real lack of understanding how community pharmacy is paid because we're paid from a global sum. So actually, the global sum will remain static no matter how many prescriptions go in or out of that. So I do explain that to uh, the, when I get contact from practices. But if you're in a community pharmacy and you get a GP practice who either um, refuses to do any seven days for whatever reason, or starts changing all your seven days to 28 days. What, what can you do about that? Ashley, oh, you're jumping in, <laughs> but you're welcome. I've been doing it today, that's why it's fresh on the mind. Um, I, think, I think this is a battle that we've, um, we've had for years and years and years. I mean, I don't think this has gone away for the 20 odd years that, that certainly I've been, I've been practicing. I think one, one thing I find with, with all of these, and I'm sure you're aware is, I think the relationship that you have with your local general practice um, is of paramount importance. So over the last five years, I have often got those exact letters, Ruth, that say, as of next month, we will not do any seven day prescribing at all. Everything's moving to 28 days and we won't do X, Y and Z. And I think once you pick up the phone and have a, a reasoned discussion and debate as to what you're doing, why you're doing it, how we monitor it, what safety checks are in place, how we monitor wastage, how we're delivering it, how you're changing prescriptions mid month, um, and you invite somebody from the practice in to see your processes, it changes that whole, oh, I wasn't realising that that was done. We've just been told to do this from somewhere on high. So um, we've constantly challenged every practice that have done those kind of blanket letters to say, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Um, and it seems to go away for another year, 18 months until the next load of letters keep coming round again. So I think a lot of it goes back down to the relationship you have and to choose your battles. Um, practices are sometimes doing it because they've been told to do it. Um, I'm quite fortunate in the area that we've got is that 
and there are not many providers that will do any uh, dosset boxes at all, um, whether the seven day prescriptions or 28 day prescriptions. I think there's a lot that just don't do it. So um, I, I feel that we um, are appropriate. I will just go back on the question. I think that uh, Mo mentioned before about the, the DDAs. We're doing them annually for all of our patients. So we don't just fire and forget. Each year we'll redo them in case circumstances change. And we often are finding that we're moving people off a compliance aid back onto original packs. And I think that also goes down well with practices when you feel that they're no longer relevant. So it, it goes that back down to the relationships that I feel that you've got and um, a reasoned amount. And I think if you talk to them about where the money comes from and actually some, sometimes it can reduce drug spend in terms of not throwing away prescriptions. Um, and we've got tools like electronic repeat dispensing and uh, um, uh, repeat prescribing. So they will help practices with their um, their management of it. It doesn't take too much too much admin time for, for, for them to do it. Thank you, Ruth, Ashley. Sorry, uh, Ruth, uh, can I just, Ruth, sorry, can I just jump in on a couple of points though for contractors? So if, if you are asked to do a 28 day prescription, you know, we, our surgery has just done it and we've pointed out to them that the patient will get four trays at one go. You are not allowed to serial dispense. All four trays go down at one go. You cannot, should not make changes to them because that is not in our contract either. So if the doctor wants to change that goes into an MCA, it should be a complete new prescription for all the items. And it's these conversations that need to be had and obviously not putting in medicines that aren't stable for more than seven days. Um, and I'll be honest with you, our practice changed an awful lot. Um, and gradually, this going back to seven days because eventually the patients aren't uh, coping with the 28 days. But it's just be very clear to them that if they ask for 28 days, that is what the patient will get. And bearing in mind also that the patient should dispense in these two. You know, if you change something like that, it can have a massive impact on how they cope with the medication. So it's definitely worth pointing that out as well. Um, and, and we've had similar to Ashley, we've spoken to the surgery when they've brought this up. And by explaining what we do, um, they've not gone ahead with it and, and they've not mentioned it for a while. So um, it, it's just worth being sure about what you can and can't do. And that's why it's good to spend some time reading the guides on the website, because then you know that what you're telling people is right. And you, you have the confidence to stand by that because you do get a lot of pressure sometimes from people to put medication into just set boxes. Um, so just make sure you know what you're saying is right. Um, that's that's the biggest thing I think. Thank you, Amanda. And I just put the website just so people can see. Um, it might look different because we are going to transfer to a new website, but all the information is still going to be there. We've got a seven day prescription guide, very clear as to when actually clinically a seven day prescription is uh, relevant. Um, relevant. Um, so that might be a really useful one. Contractor guide, um, a really good summary of um, what we are obliged and what we're not obliged to do. Um, MCA notification form can be really helpful if you are requesting seven days for a clinical reason because it, it puts the rationale in there. It's a very difficult for the practice to argue with that. Um, we've got the seven day tool um, as well. And we also have um, links to the um, SPS somewhere on here, but that's also in that uh, MDS, MCA notification form. Um, so really helpful, thank you. And I think it's really important to echo, you should know your stuff. And, um, you know, if the GP is asking for an MCA in our guidance, you'll see statements around the fact that if you're asking for it, you should be obliged, you know, you should be willing to do seven days because you haven't had to make that adjustment. Um, so. Can I just then request seven day prescriptions for all MCA patients? As a pharmacy. Sorry, ask that question again, Ruth. So, yeah, so can a pharmacy request seven day prescriptions for all their MCAs? Be nice. <laughs> but uh, you, you, no. should only ask, you should only ask for seven day prescriptions for people that can only cope with seven day yeah. medication at a time. If people can cope with four trays, then we should be giving four trays. Yeah. I think 
going back a little bit um, earlier, if if um, if you've done an assessment, whatever that assessment looks like, as we spoke about earlier, <clears throat> and you feel that under the Equalities Act, a reasonable adjustment is required for the patient, you, you decide what that reasonable adjustment is. It may be that they just need their tablets popping out into bottles with wing tops, you know, easy tops, et cetera. But if you've decided that that patient needs a, an MCA, a dosset, um, because they have a disability and, and that's what's required to help them, um, then that is what you have to do um, under the law to, to help them cope with that disability. And whether that's under seven day scripts or 28 day scripts. Um, however, if there is a clinical risk to the patient, that for example, they won't cope with four trays, um, despite them qualifying under EA, then you, I would say, then you need to raise that with the practice to say that there is a risk and so seven day prescriptions may be appropriate for that reason. But if there's no clinical risk, then you can't demand seven day scripts in that scenario. Um, but if it's for a patient, and this is me speaking myself here now, if it's for a patient, um, or doesn't qualify under EA, but um, for their convenience or the GP's request for adherence, they want doc sets, then I would put the ball back in their court and say, this wouldn't be funded by the NHS. A patient may may not want to pay for it privately. And if they don't want to pay for it privately, how are you going to support the patient? So that actually, um, you know, I'm, I'm recomp recompensed for the time and effort that's spent making that doc set. And therefore you might want to consider giving seven day scripts. Yeah, I've just put on the screen. I'm, I am a bit excited about this because I've been working alongside um, uh, other pharmacists across the ICS on this leaflet for about a year now. So I'm sorry it's taking so long, but it's not a leaflet to give to patients, but it's a leaflet that all health professionals are going to be encouraged to use with patients about managing medication. In here, we talk about the options available to people and we do talk about MCAs. But we're really clear that medicines should actually be put in original packs. Uh, we're really clear that none of these uh, uh, medicines compliance aids guarantee people are going to take their medicines. And it is also very clear that a pharmacy may give it to you free of charge if you comply to the um, DDA, but they may also charge you for it. So actually, it's really clear around um, the fact that the pros and cons, um, but also that as a pharmacy, you may charge if somebody doesn't meet the Equality Act requirements for you to provide one free of charge. So um, that leaflet isn't on our website yet because it only came out today, but it will be on our website in the next week or so. I have put the link in there for you. So um, looking at time, we could um, move on to the next topic or one, one more MCA sorry, question. Ruth, I don't know if you noticed what Felix has got his hand up. So oh, I hadn't, sorry, I've been looking at it. Felix, how can we help you? You're muted, Felix. I don't know if you realise. You're in shade. I can't quite see you. Right. Ah. Okay. Just turning a bit. I think because the window, the, there's a plenty of light outside at the moment. Thank you. Right. I think part of the challenges we do have as well uh, uh, is with our colleagues that are in the practices now. Uh, either they get the direction from the, well, now that we are in a smaller uh, group, now that we are in a smaller group in the uh, PCN, it's much easier to manage than when we were much broader under the uh, uh, under the the previous uh, group anyway, because the lead pharmacy in the in the I think they give the direction of swapping patient to uh, the MDA to uh, from seven days to because we experienced this about five years ago in a, a longer area there. Majority of our patients on one night, one day, one night, they just decided that they were going to go all on 28 days. And I have to give them, look, we are going to go on 28 days, we have no problem with that. But the problem is if we have to change a patient, you have to do a new set of prescriptions for us. And that's one, they find it really difficult to manage. And gradually, we now put a condition in, if a patient has got any changes at all, 
Rather do it because we, we have got to send that singular item or whatever you change to the patient without putting it in the box unless you do a new set. So there was this confusion that came in and well, eventually we agreed that, okay, if somebody has got more than two consecutive changes in their boxes, that is what they will revert that person back to seven days screen. So we find that our colleagues in the uh, PCT or PCN, they are actually making this situation, you know, more rigid or more difficult for us because they dictate to the, or well, they advise the pharmacy or the surgeries on the way to go on such things. And like we said at the beginning, forgetting that whatever they do does not affect the overall money they pay to pharmacists, but they just think they are saving people money and, and causing us problems. Thank you. That's just what I want to chip in. Thank you, Felix. I think you just had the importance of talking to your local practice about it to explain the impact it has. So they do understand around community pharmacy funding and the fact that, you know, it doesn't save the NHS money. And I think, you know, that's also using our resources. Our resources will have a lot of the statements you've put in there, Felix, around you know, if something changes, you have to reissue all the prescriptions. That is in black and white on our resources. It's often easier to kind of talk to somebody and point to something in black and white because then they can see you're you know you've got some foundation for what you're saying and the resources that we've used I know because actually they get quoted back at me by the CCG so they we've written them to be system pr uh, processes so that you know they are usually very well accepted. Ruth in the, in, in the chat I've put some examples of the SPS website if people want to copy the um, the links and it will show you what it actually says about putting them in in MCAs? I've just seen as well, Asif put a really good question and it was going to be my last question, so we're definitely doing it now. So thanks Asif. What if about a carer who's requesting trays? How should we best approach this? Very good question, Asif. I think you've got an advice leaflet about that very problem <laughs> on the website. So I'd have a read of that, but it depends how much support they're providing to the patient with the medication. So you need to sort of find that out um if they are giving the patient the medication then they wouldn't be covered under the disability act so you, you're not obliged to do a trade and they should really be ideally giving them out the original packs anyway um and that's cqc advice isn't it amanda so it's not just you know it CQC say that if there's a carer going in, a funded carer going in to support somebody with their medicines, they should prompt from original boxes, they should not be requesting an MCA. Um, what I hear a lot from carers or care organisations is um, we can't give it unless it's in a tray. Now, that might be their policy. It's not CQC guidance, and it's really important that we understand that. They might be telling you their own personal policy, but that doesn't mean that you're obliged to actually follow their policy. Um, you, this, I think ultimately, the really key point here is the decision to give an MCA or not is the community pharmacist or community pharmacy. It's not the prescriber, it's not the carer, it's not the family, it's not the nurse. It's the community pharmacist. You have to make that decision. So if somebody's care is telling you, oh, we can't give it unless it's in a tray, well, they need to look at their policy and they need, they need to refer back to the CQC guidance. Um, you know, so that's worth pointing out because we hear a lot of that, um, a lot of browbeating goes on on the back of that. That, that. Our guidance has that link to the CQC, so you can actually use that as well to actually find the source guidance to wave at them. Sorry, Amanda. I was just going to say that that's why it's so important to, to read the guidance and, and know it so that you can stand by what you're saying, uh, because they do put a lot of pressure on. Um, it's quite difficult to stand up to sometimes. Ruth, can I just add just something? I, I spoke with a colleague in North Yorkshire a couple of weeks ago and, and they've moved, they've gone down the policy of if it's not entitled to under the disability and and uh, getting seven day prescriptions they've actually moved all of their other patients and having it funded privately through um through uh, family family members and explaining to the the son or daughter that it's not funded through the nhs but they're quite happy to pay a fee because it's peace of mind for um the pharmacy concerned to order and provide it and it's gone down quite well 
but obviously that only works in certain areas and it won't work in highly deprived areas and, and others but it is an option if it's not covered in the nhs and i think mohammed alluded to it earlier on it can be funded and people are paying fees for trays that aren't um being funded through the nhs well not funded through the nhs but you know what i'm saying yes, in terms of we do know exactly what you mean yeah i think that's a business decision for each pharmacy what i would say if you want to take away uh, when you're doing free mcas and stop free mcas um we did some trade yeah, some guidance and we covered that in a bit more detail it's still on um on the watch back um uh, of our, our previous training event um so i would do that cautiously because you can't just stop you have to explain give people that, that response it's it is a bit of a process you need to follow it's always easier to start a new process with new requests than it is to review the other ones you, you can i think you're right to do review them but just don't just stop them and say well we're not doing them anymore and please don't just say we don't do MCAs. You need to give a rationale for it because otherwise you're going to trip yourself up. Last question from Kim. Um, if we are saying no to carers around MCAs, we should uh, we should offer them a mar sheet to help them with administration their medication to their clients. Um, does somebody want to answer that one or do you want me to answer it? Kim, there's no obligation to do that. Um, they're supposed to provide their own mar sheets. Um, and keep their own records. So we, we're not obliged to do that. If you, if you decide to do that, that's, that's you know, a personal choice, but there's no obligation to do that. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, all the information we've given around MCA, actually, you could just put Mar charts and it's exactly the same thing. We're not obliged. So I'm going to move us on now um, to our next topic, which is deliveries. So we know during the pandemic, a massive number of people uh, wanted to have their prescriptions delivered. We eventually did get some of those deliveries covered by the pandemic delivery service, but by no means all of them. And we know the cost of actually providing delivery is becoming more and more as staff wages increase and fuel increases. Um, as part of preparing for today, I did a bit of a stroll poll and asked a few contractors, you know, um, how, what proportion of your total prescription volume do you deliver? Um, and it varied from uh, 10 to 50% of prescriptions. Um, it seemed to vary a little bit by geography, um, comment that, you know, multiple deliveries are made to the same people. Um, you know, it, it does depend. It can be higher in stores that have high MCAs. Um, but, and some are also looking to review this and reduce it to offer them all to housebound and vulnerable people. So our next few questions about deliveries, before we go on, I just need to make it really clear, distance selling pharmacies, DSPs, are obliged contractually to deliver 100% of their, their contracts. So this conversation does not relate to DSPs, this is only for uh, 40 or 100 hour contractors. So, do we have to deliver a prescription if somebody asks for it, or a doctor asks for it? Simple answer, no. We certainly don't. So NHS is not, uh, you know, does not fund um, a, a home home delivery. That is not part of our NHS services. And I think there's a misconception out there that it is. Um, but we can be really clear: it's a business decision for each and every contractor as to whether they would like to make deliveries or not, whether they charge for deliveries or not, and what radius they put on deliveries or what kind of limitations they put on. So. Um, if a contractor currently offers free delivery, um, but they're now starting to look at the cost of doing that and you know, noticing they're escalating, as I said before, can a pharmacy introduce charges for delivery? Has anybody done that? I've got any top tips for people around deliveries and, and charging. I think advice that I have been given previously is that if you are going to start and bring a charge in, you may want to consider making it clear to new patients or new deliveries first that you're going to charge a service because it is very difficult to implement a charge on somebody where you have been probably delivering free for many many years before before this and they may feel that you know it's a step backwards but you can do it because it isn't an nhs service you are providing a direct service to that patient Thank you. And is it, uh, how, you know, has anyone got an experience they can share around actually how they've tried to be more efficient in their deliveries? Um, we've been looking at hours recently. Um, and one of the things we find is that quite often we're delivering somebody's out and we used to pop a note through the door that said, you know, we tried to deliver your prescription, but you weren't there. Please get in touch to arrange re-delivery. Um, we've changed that now to, um, we tried to deliver your prescription and you're out your prescription will be back at the pharmacy for you to collect. 
So it's kind of putting the onus on them to come and collect it instead of us having to re-deliver. And um, we've also trying to deliver to certain areas on certain days so that we're not going all over the place. Um, so just things like that really is what, what we've put in place. Thanks, Amanda. Anybody got anything else they want to uh, share? Ashley? Well, we, we've done similar to what Amanda's done. We're now stopping re-deliveries because it was becoming ridiculous. And it, again, we don't want to um, isolate those vulnerable or housebound patients that genuinely do need that service. So we, we've now, we're changing the language that we use because I think previously we all used to say, um, and when do you want it delivered as a kind of this kind of the free service. So we change the language, especially with new, new customers. We always encourage them to come and collect. We always encourage them to have those of a family member that can come to collect or a relative. Um, and we go down that route. So the, we don't opt them in automatically. Do you want to have a delivery? We always say we're ready to collect from X and then we go down a number of prompts. And what you find then is that um, it, we, we kind of automatically say also that we only have a number of delivery slots available per, per day for the housebound and vulnerable. And if they know then that you can't have it instantly and the next slot might be in two or three days time, then lo and behold, somebody is able to come and pick up that prescription. So we're just trying to change the language slightly and communicate that it's not a service provided um, and we've managed to be a little bit more efficient in that and reduce our deliveries. I think the other one as well is speak to your GP surgeries because we all know that we get requests that this is urgent can you deliver it and you know if you can make the surgeries aware that that you know you can't just drop everything and deliver something and they may need to ask family members to come and get them then you know that is, is a really important process, but you don't feel pressurised into doing something which you're not contracted to do. You know, you've got to be reasonable about it, but, you know, contact the local surgeries, have those discussions that we can't just deliver at short notice. Because if you do, you'll end up, everybody will contact you when it's urgent. It just is a pressure that we don't need at the moment. Similar to the MCA system, it's having that discussion, um, you know, to talk of, you know, explain it's a voluntary service, explain that it's, you know, normally on a, a next working day basis, your driver isn't sat there waiting for deliveries to do urgently. Um, you know, it is something you've, you've already got allocated. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I, like it's not an NHS service really helps because I think there is that misconception because so many pharmacies do it. Um, and I often talk to some contractors say, oh, well, if I don't deliver, then somebody might go elsewhere. Um, has anybody else thought about that? And, you know, that, that kind of viewpoint, well, if we don't deliver, the, pe the person could start using another pharmacy. How do people feel about that? Or it, it is a risk, um, but it, it is something you've got to weigh up against how much you're spending on delivering several times a, a month, maybe to the same person. Is, is it worth hanging on to them or not? Um, maybe looking at if they've got other people in the household that might swap as well. It, it's just something you've got to weigh up, you know, how much you want to how much you want to do, whether it's worth your while or not. Thanks, Amanda. I was going to briefly... Um, it's, uh, I don't know if we have any information, um, Ruth. Sorry, I got cut out there. I've got unstable. Yeah, I noticed you disappeared. I'm very glad yeah, you're back. Apologies. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, the likes uh, of our colleagues in, in Boots and, and Lloyds, they started charging a, a little while ago. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's any data that would suggest that they've lost any significant number of patients as a result of that. Um, it's certainly a fear that we all have talking to, um, you know, colleagues and contractors. Um, but, you know, where is the balance? Um, particularly when funding is stretched and you're struggling. So at what point do you, you know, think about streamlining at least if not altering or um, you know start and charge for your delivery service 
Thank you. So I'm um, just going to check if I'm to get the questions. I just wanted to point out this on the web our website. So if you go to the training development section of our website and go to past events, we have for some time now been recording the event. So we've got an event that's called uh, Reset, Reform, Recover. That's the event where we've discussed delivery previously. And we've got some top tips for you in there and a bit more detail and also MCA. So uh, people can go back and watch that again. Um, hopefully you'll find that helpful if you want to cover the topic more. So has anybody got any questions? Um, I was going to check the, the uh, chat. Can't see any questions in the chat room. Okay, cool. I'll just point out if you do start charging, that's an extra thing that you've got to, <laughs> to uh, manage as well. So and keep track of. So it's it's uh, quite a bit of extra work um, recording everything and and keeping records of who's paid what and when. So that that's something to bear in mind. And all join Deliveroo. <laughs> yeah, after you've checked your indemnity, of course. Right, so emergency supplies. Um, uh, you know, talking to contractors, I really hear there's a rise number of surgeries asking patients to go to the pharmacies for an emergency supply or just to, to, for a loan because their prescription isn't ready. Um, it definitely had an increase. Uh, you know, uh, has any of the committee members got any comments on why they think this is happening and what do you think is causing this? I think we're getting more. We're getting more requests because people can't contact the surgeries and they're finding it very difficult to get their prescriptions when they would have expected them pre-COVID because of, of the way things have changed. Um, and so we've definitely seen um, a lot more patients coming in who haven't got prescriptions and say they've not got tablets. Um, so it's, it's leading to, to major, major problems. Yeah, yeah. And and the add-on to that as well, Ruth, as well as that, is um, a lot of the surgeries now um, in regard to prescription issues um, are outsourcing that to PCN teams or pharmacists who are not stationed at the surgery. Um, so it's basically sent as a task to a person sat remotely somewhere. Um, and that person may or may not be familiar with the patient. And, you know, they'll have... Um, an in-tray that they're working through, so they may not understand the agency, um, etc. So that in itself can cause um, requests for emergency prescriptions. One other aspect here that we've noticed, and I'd be interested to see with any of the other pharmacists on here, a lot of surgeries are now taking away responsibilities of ordering and going back and not allowing pharmacists to order. So in East Leeds, where we've got a couple of pharmacies, all of the surgeries have now almost simply stopped unless the vulnerable patients, pharmacists from ordering. And we noticed um, when they did this, let's just say that the communication to patients was poor to zero. So um, they weren't informed about it, which led to difficulty in being able to manage that. I think when pharmacists are managing and ordering, whether it's through managed repeats or ordering process, you can, you can educate your patients when to order and, and manage that process. When that's taken out of your control and it's gone back down to the surgeries, suddenly you're not aware of when those prescriptions are due to drop down. So we have seen literally in the last month a massive increase in um, emergency supply or CPCS referrals or, you know, Quasar, I need to get a loan, the surgeries told me to come around because the surgeries haven't got to grips with that management process yet. So I'm hoping it will smooth itself out over the coming months. But I think that's literally a critical point because of beginning of April, they've literally all switched over to this. And, and that is a policy across West Yorkshire that farms aren't allowed to order. Um, we, we haven't got time to go into that in detail. What's the difference then between an emergency supply and a loan? Is there a difference? Yes. So if you emergency supply, you can charge the patient for it. It's, it is in regulation. It is, it is not a service. The problem you have if you give a loan is what happens when the GP then doesn't give the prescription that you've loaned to the patient. So the, there are pitfalls of doing loans that if you give something and the doctor doesn't issue a FP10 for that product, you uh, have caused yourself a, a, a bit of an issue and there is no regulation around loans either. So actually we should be doing it all as an emergency supply, which means we should be writing um, the emergency supply up in our, um, our uh, POM registers, is that correct? Yes. 
hopefully you've got a system that does it automatically for you to make life easier, but they should all be down as emergency supplies. Yeah, and you can charge people. So I think it's about explaining to the surgery that you actually you can't do loans. Emergency supplies are quite um, labour intensive um, and, uh, and ask not to send people around with the expectation you can lend them a few tablets because actually uh, we know it happens in reality, but we, should, we shouldn't really be doing it. Um, I think that's it for, for emergency supplies. Has anybody got any comments they would like to make or any questions they'd like to ask about that particular topic before we move on? So our next topic is generally dispensing. Um, so we know, we know for the PSC um, uh, pressure survey that there's drug shortages. Um, we get frequent reports uh, that there's uh, generics are not available, but there's a brand available and can't the pharmacy just dispense a brand? So, you know, does a pharmacy have to dispense a branded product against a generic prescription if the generic is out of stock? So the simple answer is no. Um, again, if a pharmacy contractor wants to do that, that's up to them, you know, knowing the financial consequences, if that's the choice to take, that's entirely up to them. Um, but no, you don't have to give a brand when a prescription is written for a generic. So I don't know, I can't think of an example off the top of my head at the moment, but um, where a generic might be out of stock, but um, the branded equivalent is available. Um, personally, what I do is, is communicate that to the surgery and let them know of the situation and, and the alternatives, whether they wish to prescribe an alternative generic or the brand for that specific generic that is available. So what if you, and this challenge I know comes back, Mo, but you're, you're NHS, you're obliged to dispense it. It's for, it's for the patient's interest. You need to dispense it because you can get that product. Um, yeah, and the drug tariff specifies, you know, how you're paid and reimbursed for that product. Um, so I'm complying to the drug tariff in, you know, if, if, a, if it's a branded product that's available and not the generic and the reimbursement for that is obviously nowhere near what you're actually going to get, you're going to make a loss, then it becomes a clinical decision also for the practitioner um to to be fair and reasonable for the pharmacy to dispense um and not at a loss yeah are any also, obligations to provide a generic against a generic with reasonable promptness not to provide a brand okay. sorry david but at this point can i just point out that if you get a message in the notes to pharmacy that say supply brand you know you do not have an obligation to do that and you know when we get those messages from gps we say if the GP has got a clinical reason for the brand to be supplied, and that even that may even just be a brand of generic, that the brand of generic or the brand is actually prescribed in the drug field. If they've got a clinical, if they believe there is a clinical need for the patient to have a specific make or brand, the GPs should be prescribing that because if they put it in the dosage field or anywhere else on the prescription, you will not get paid for it. So it is really important that if you are being asked to, to supply a brand or a, a manufacturer, a specific manufacturer, unless it is in the, the drug field of the prescription on the electronic prescription, you will not get paid for it. And that can be costing you quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of money if that's something that you do on a, on a regular occurrence. I think it's important to look at, you know, if you're thinking about prescribing a brand, it is really important to look at the differential and understand what loss you are, are making because it can be quite huge, can't it, David? It, 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 well, yeah, I mean, so, some of them, you can be into um, tens, if not hundreds of times difference in price, uh, especially if there's a shortage with the generic. Which takes me to... <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ruth, and even within generics, I see, um, and this is a common one, so patients want Zentiva um, painkillers, um, cocodamol, um, soluble, um, et cetera. And Zentiva is much more expensive than your standard, um, you know, other uh, generics available, um, and, and therefore the reimbursement prices is not quite Zentiva price. Um, 
so that again, if it's not written in the drug field, as David says, if it's written in the additional information, patient prefers Zentiva, you won't get paid for Zentiva, as an example. Thank you, which takes, so it's Felix, is that you waving your hand? You're muted, Felix, I can't hear you. Oh, I can see you now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right, the, the issue of uh, branded generics, uh, because we get quite a lot of that, especially, uh, you know, the modified release uh, metformin, for example, I've been practices in our areas, in our area, I just go on, on Sukato so much so that they have to put meaning to it, to the patient that Sukato means meant for me. I mean, I mean, we, I, so, I know it's, sorry. So I we're about to dodge about generator. I might answer, we might answer some of your questions, Felix. So are we able okay. to just cover that? Because I'm mindful of time because um, we're having such a good time with discussion. We've, we've got just over 10 minutes left. Okay. So, Branded prescribing, so why is, and branded generics in particular, um, we know this is really important because, you know, these are influence margin, they really impact, if you have a lot of branded generics, really impact on you. So it's a big piece of work we've done at Community Pharmacy, West Yorkshire. Um, I don't know if you have a chance to see it yet, but Adil, one of our other committee members, has done a fantastic blog, and I suggest you read Adil's blog. While I find the blog and put it into the chat for people to follow the message, um, can somebody pick up a bit of a summary around branded generics, the work we're doing? And actually, as a contractor, what do you do when you see branded generics? Uh, as, as an LPC, we have challenged... Um the CCGs on the use of, of, of branded generics and we highlighted to them that a lot of branded generics are, appear to be higher than the drug tariff price. Um, so we've had commitments from the CCGs that if we feed back to them and we have got a list of, of the CCG emails to feed back to them, if you're seeing high use of branded generics to feed that back to them and they've going to look at that um, because they believe that a lot of them or they have told us that they believe a lot of them have historic prescriptions and shouldn't be branded generics now so we, we are we are getting somewhere with branded generics but it is a a steady path forward I think would be the best way to to say it but it is it is on the agenda locally and nationally um, about the use of branded generics. And uh, I've put a link in the, uh, the chat to the blog. It's on our website under the news section. And I can go to the blog every um, single time, uh, so every single month. Give that a read because in that it outlines the issue, but it also outlines what you can do. And actually, if all contractors were flagging um, the issues with branded generics into the CCGs, we will get more and more change. So it's really worth your while doing. Amanda, I hope you don't mind me picking on you, but I know that you've been reporting some issues to your CCG. What should be in your experience of that? Yeah, I mean, we were still seeing prescriptions for Simvador, which have obviously been unavailable for over at least a year. Um, and I've kept raising it with the surgeries locally and not got anywhere, but I did send an email when we got the contact details for the medicines optimization team in Calderdale and I sent them an email and they've actually stopped those prescriptions now. So, um, yeah, so they have, they have responded and, and other things as well that I've brought up with them. They have, um, you know, either stopped certain branded generics being prescribed or, um, there was another issue they were going to swap everybody onto Fenbid gel, but they rang us before that, before they started doing it. Unfortunately, we were able to say that actually there was a supply problem with it, so they didn't go ahead with that. So just anything that you can feed back to them, that help, it helps us um, on the ground if we can't get something, just report it back to them and, and hopefully they will do something about it. And all those de all those details are on the bottom of the blog that Ruth has put yeah. in the in the chat. So I, I would download that, and then at least you've got the contact details for your area to be able to report back your your branded generic issues. 
So how do we know which brand of generics, you talked about historical or legacy brand of generics, David, how, how would we know which ones are, the, the CCGs might still be recommending, or which ones are ones which they recommended a while ago, they've stopped really re recommending it, but they haven't actually asked the prescribers to change, how do we find those out? Well, I, th I think a lot of them that we picked up on were ones where they were actually higher than the drug tariff price. So, you know, we, we, that's, I mean, that's, that's where the original challenge came from that why you're using a product that's actually higher than the drug tariff price that um, we would get reimbursed at. Thank you. Felix, has that answered what you were gonna ask or did you have something further to ask? Yes, that's, that's fine, thank you. So hopefully you've got some tools there to really help you as a contractor, you know, question when you see branded generics and hopefully flag them and get them changed. So your metformin MR, I'm quite sure isn't on the Bradford list anymore. So it's about how you flag that and, and you request that it's actually then taken off and we can go back. The other thing to, to, that we haven't mentioned, again, it's on our website and let me just find it and share it with you, is we do um, on our dispensing pages um, under essential services, we do have a branded generics letter. I'm just gonna try and share a screen with you to show you where it is. So yeah, contracts and services, essential services and dispensing. Uh, you can see the quick links here, branded generics. So we've got a letter um, that I don't know if it'll follow through the link. It often doesn't work. Can you see that template letter there? So the template letter goes through the reasons why branded generic, the impacts it has, funding, but also the patient care reasons. Um, uh, you know, the, the fact it takes time from a GP practices because they have to stop it back when they decide they don't want to use it anymore. So if you do see your practice using it, that letter can either be a template you can use or it can certainly help inform you in your conversations you have with your practice. So um, as I say, that's in the dispensing section of our website under contracts and services, essential services and dispensing. Do we have any more questions about branded generics? So the last thing that I wanted to kind of go through was out of stock items um, and stock shortages. Um, we know that there's, uh, it seems to be becoming more of an issue again, significant problems and issues with um, stock shortages. Does anybody have any suggestions of how you help manage that with your GP surgeries or anything else you do when you notice a, stocks, a stock shortage? Well, I'm gonna put my PSNC hat on here. Well, I'm glad you are, David. <laughs> um, it is vitally important that you report shortages to PSNC. They have a spreadsheet. You can report them singly or as a spreadsheet. Because if we do not report shortages to PSNC and the prices that you are paying, PSNC has got no evidence to go to the department to get concession prices. Now I know we're all busy. I know we're all running around in circles, but at the end of the day, if PSNC doesn't get that information on prices, they cannot challenge for concession prices. So it is, you know, it, it, I know it's an extra job on top, but if not, we just, if they haven't got the ammunition to, 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 to challenge the drug tariff prices, we won't get concession prices. So you see, I know it's a lot, it's extra work, but it is in our best interest so that we're paid accurately for what we are supplying and, and at what price we are supplying them to the NHS. We've um, we've saved the link to it on, on our internet page and um, all the staff, when they're doing the orders, they, they know to go and report those. So I, I don't have to do that, they do it for me. Anything that any top tips around communicating uh, with your practice about shortages? We tend to, if we have a shortage and we get a prescription with a shortage, if we can, we will return the prescription to the surgery, but actually tell them what we have got in stock. Um, and, you know, if, if possible, keep that stock to one side for that, that patient so that we're not just going to and fro from the doctor's surgery 
you're getting multiple prescriptions back for products that you can't get. So it, it takes a little bit of extra work, but if we can, we, we feed back what we have got that would be suitable for that prescription and then hope that the GPs um, supply what we've uh, we've told them that we've, we've got. Thanks, David. I've just put a couple of links in the chat. So I've put a link to the PSC, but I've also put a link to SBAR. So SBAR is a way of communication. It's a, it's a form you may want to use to communicate with GP practices about what's out of stock. It explains them why, it explains what the alternative is, and it's, it's an evidence way of um, having effective communication. It could be used for any kind of clinical handover, but it could, you know, out of stock is one of the reasons we give on there. And they've also put a link there to a leaflet which is a bit out of date because it was pre-Brexit but a, a, a leaflet that explains stock shortages and why they happen which again you might find some of those messages helpful so I'll pop that in there for you. So we're coming towards the end of our time tonight does anybody have any questions um, either related to the topics we've covered or any questions that we haven't covered tonight that you would that you wanted to hear from? No. Um, if you think of something, you know, we don't, you know, you know, it's not, it wasn't a test. So if you think of something that we haven't answered tonight, do email us at info at cpwy.org. I'll put that into the chat. Um, thank you very much for attending tonight. I found it really, um, uh, I hope you found it really helpful um, listening to the chat. Um, more than happy to do a similar kind of thing. So what would be really helpful for, um, for us is if you could give us a little bit of feedback about the event tonight, we won't take it personally. If you just put something into the chat, you know, um, what did you, you know, what did you find helpful? And really good to know what, what do you think would have made it better than it was, just so we can learn. So if you can just put a few uh, comments in the chat, that would be really, really helpful. Um, but while uh, you do that, um, I would just like to extend a, a big thank you to Mohammed, Amanda, David and Ashley, because without them, this event would have been uh, very boring indeed, just been battling on. So thank you for your insightful comments and for sharing your practice and how you deal with some of the issues which we know that everybody's facing. Um, so thank you very much to you guys and um, all uh, have a really good evening. As I say, do keep in touch. You're our eyes and ears at Community Pharmacy West George. So do keep using that info email with any queries or questions you have um, so that we know what your issues are so we can try and help support you. So thank you and good night. I'm going to stop recording now.